Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the new Bitcoin spot exchange coming very soon from BitMEX. Most of you have heard about BitMEX, one of the biggest Bitcoin companies, which has been at the forefront of Bitcoin growth over the years and did a lot to help Bitcoin emerge victorious and immutable from the hard fork wars of 2015 to 2017, probably the biggest threat to Bitcoin to date. BitMEX are now rolling out new products and services, including a spot exchange and an online learning academy. And I'm very excited to be working with their new academy to prepare an introductory course on the economics of Bitcoin, utilizing top multimedia resources, which will be made available for free online for the world to learn about Bitcoin. After having spoken to the BitMEX team about what's in store, I'm very impressed by all of the things that are coming for their users. There are a lot of new products in the pipeline and a lot of momentum for the team. Keep an eye on them. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson has an MS degree in electrical and electronics engineering, and he's been involved in tech and software for many years. Uh, but we're not hosting him today to talk to us about tech and software. We're here to talk about climate. Um, now, Tom has absolutely no credentials in climate. And so if credentials are your thing, now is the time to get uh, agitated and uh, angry and uh, denounce us for hosting somebody who doesn't have the right uh, credentials to talk about these topics, who hasn't been approved by the Church of Climate um, to discuss things. But if you care about thinking about things, um, you care about ideas rather than credentials, and if you'd rather use your brain than uh, trust people who tell you their authority um, supersedes what your brain says, then you might want to stick around. Uh, Tom has a blog and is pretty active on Twitter. And I've come across his Twitter many years ago, I don't even remember when, and it was um, pretty uh, influential for me in understanding the issue of climate change and in understanding how to think about it in a rational scientific uh, way. Um, Tom's uh, ideas and work on this uh, are just the work of an intelligent outsider who has no, um, who, who doesn't get paid from this uh, topic. He has no interest except really discovering the truth. And um, he's really helped me um, develop my understanding of this topic. And I thought it would be great to host him, to ask him about some of the most important questions related to the topic of climate and climate change, which um, is becoming an increasingly significant topic. Um, and I, I discuss it in detail in my book, In the Fiat Standard. Now, many people tell me all the time, you know, you should stick to economics, stick to Bitcoin. This is your expertise. Why are you talking about climate? You're not a climatologist. You don't have a degree in it. And even though I kind of do have a degree in this stuff, I obviously my degree isn't what matters. But I think it is extremely related to the topic of money and Bitcoin because I think, um, you know, the conclusions of climate science and the uh, conceived um, notions of settled science are 
in many ways extremely important economically they have enormous implications and what uh, is being promoted as you know the way to fix the climate has enormous economic implications and i would say um, it is enormously important for the understanding the topic of bitcoin and fiat money because a uh, the fiat money is what finances this science and i think it's a great example of uh, how the scientific process gets corrupted with the use of uh, fiat money instead of science being open to competition and having a free market and ideas we have scientific authorities uh, deciding what is correct and what is acceptable and what is uh, not and also i think uh, because of the topic of inflation and we're going to talk more about this later on today um uh, we see this with nutrition and then we had a recent uh, discussion with the dr kate shanahan about this and we see this with climate in both issues we're talking about two goods that are extremely price sensitive that are extremely um, susceptible to price rises with uh, inflation and in both cases the supposed uh, consensus of scientific experts wants you to stop consuming these goods because they have a lot of uh, consensus on why you should not be eating meat and instead substituting it with cheap uh, industrial crops and why you should not be consuming the fuels that we need to survive the winter and to move around and the fuels that have built our modern world and allow us to have electronics and all kinds of amazing uh, and essential goods how why we should stay away from these and go back to pre-industrial uh, technology in both cases i think um the, the the impact of inflation is felt at the production of the science but also at the conclusions which lead us to move away from um from the things that uh, are pretty price sensitive so i think climate is totally up your alley if you're interested in bitcoin and money and inflation if those topics interest you i think you should pay more attention to climate and then just uh, listen to what you know the consensus says so uh tom thank you so much for joining us good to be here thanks for having me on so first of all could you tell us a little bit about your background and um what gives you the audacity to opine on something in which you are not a credentialed expert yeah i am not a climatologist but i, I have that tech and software background that you mentioned and uh, i got into uh looking at scientific debates back in 2005 with the ivory build woodpecker rediscovery there was a peer review paper that came out with uh, 17 authors and for a while, people believed that they had rediscovered this extinct woodpecker. And I'm a bird watcher, and I just took a look at the evidence for myself. And right away, when I looked at the evidence, you could see that they didn't have really any evidence. They had uh, people had heard some sounds, and they had a blurry video, and they had a picture of an ivory bill that was six pixels. It was only six pixels, black and white pixels, and that was supposed to be evidence that they had rediscovered an extinct bird. And that kind of blew my mind. So I heavily got involved in blogging there. And uh, Jack Hitt uh, actually wrote up uh, in his book, A Bunch of Amateurs. He wrote a chapter on uh, how this got debunked by amateurs because the professionals had believed in the, uh, the rediscovery. But uh, I checked into it. And on my blog, a lot of people also looked at the evidence and commented and just kind of ripped apart the evidence. It's, examples of, uh, it's an example of amateurs that are able to just directly look at the evidence and uh, debunk something that's just simply not true. So anyway, um, later in that debate, a meteorologist um, told me there's a lot of uh, parallels between that debate and the global warming debate. So for the last 15 years, I've been looking at the global warming debate, and it's very similar again in that the evidence uh, is just not there at all for the climate crisis. If you look at every single bit of their claims, if you look uh, for hurricanes, polar bear populations, uh, crop yields, et cetera, if you actually look at the data, there is no climate crisis so amateurs uh, are able to look at the data and debunk that one too. Yeah, so obviously this is a very big claim. Most people think, yeah. you know, 97% of scientists mm -hmm. agree it's a yes. crisis. If mm -hmm. we don't do anything, um, all kinds of vague uh, doom mm -hmm. is going to hit us. You know, the earth is gonna boil or the oceans are gonna boil and sea levels are gonna rise. Um, but I think you've, in your blog, you've got uh, six, what you call six flawed assumptions, which are basically taken for granted by most people. They think of these as just being um, uh, a given. 
But I'd like to walk through these because I think these are very, very fundamental building blocks of trying to understand what is going on in the issue of climate. And most people take them for granted. And so if you take these for granted because you know you think the experts agree, and who am I to doubt the experts, then you're going to arrive at the conclusion that indeed uh, we are in uh, we, we are facing a climate catastrophe. So let's begin with the first one. The first one says, the earth is currently too hot. Is the earth too hot? No, it is not too hot. And uh, you can look at uh, human history to see that uh, humans have always done better in warm periods, and they've historically been called optimums. And humans have struggled in cold periods. There's, uh, they've had uh, problems with crop yields and disease and uh, a lot of other problems in uh, cold periods. And during the Little Ice Age, uh, witches were burned because uh, things were crop yields were low and uh, a lot of bad things were going on, and um, life just wasn't as good in cold periods. So the whole idea that the Earth is currently too hot is uh, is not true. And then if you go back before human history, uh, it was warm enough for crocodiles and palm trees up in the Arctic. Uh, so naturally, the Earth has been way warmer than it is now, and uh, life still did just fine. You could argue that life does even better when the Earth is warmer, and. Uh, because as you go towards the equator, you get a lot more diversity than as you go towards the poles. So warmth is good for life, including humans. So the earth is not too hot. There's nothing that indicates the earth is too hot. So what do you think of the uh, historical temperature record that we have? Um, what is, uh, what, 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 what do we actually know about the history of the earth's temperature? How has it varied over the past hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of years? We see a lot of claims being made. Um, what do you think is the um, evidence yeah, I got a couple of graphs I can show you. I don't know if I should show you those now or later, but uh, yeah, let's go. Let's uh, share a screen here and take a look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a graph of just the last few thousands of years how the uh, Earth's temperature has varied. And I like to point out on the left side there, you have the Minoan warm period. So of course humans were around uh, during this time, and uh, that period was uh, warmer than anything we've seen recently. And we've also had other warm periods uh, after that, including the uh, Roman warm period and the medieval warm period. And then over on the right side, you can see the current warm period. So the whole idea of panicking at this current warm period over on the right just doesn't make any sense because even uh, you know just a few thousand years ago, it was warmer. And then also on this graph, I like to point out that uh, around 1600 is where the, the witch hunts occurred because uh, those cold times were bad times. And 50,000 witches got burned back then uh, because it's a very old and uh, very wrong idea that if the weather is bad, it's caused by people you don't like. And uh, that continues this day that uh, people want to blame uh, bad weather now on Exxon or whatever else. So it's happened for a long time and it's been wrong every time. But the warm periods have been better. Uh, that was for a few thousand years. And here's a longer view going back uh, hundreds of millions of years as to how temperatures have varied. And uh, the black line is actually carbon dioxide and the blue line here is uh, temperature. But the main thing to look at on the blue line is that for most of the last 600 million years, naturally, the Earth was much warmer than it is now. So the idea that uh, you know the Earth is mind-blowingly warm or that uh, positive feedbacks are going to cause the Earth to become uninhabitable because it's so warm right now, it's just historically, it's just not that warm right now. And while we're on this graph, I wanted to point out something very important about carbon dioxide while we're here. This black line is the, uh, the carbon dioxide line. They've tried to figure out uh, how much CO2 was in the air in parts per million. And uh, everyone agrees that uh, back here uh, a few hundred million years ago, there were thousands of parts per million of CO2 in the air. And as, as we get down here to the right, we have uh, just a little over 400 parts per million right now of CO2. So the whole idea that the air is filling up with carbon dioxide, that uh, it's uh, unnatural to have so much carbon dioxide out there is totally untrue. We have, uh, we're closer to having not enough CO2 in the air and we are to having too much CO2. I wanted to mention that while we're here. Yeah, now, um, let me be a little bit skeptical here. Um, just how good is the evidence that allows us to extrapolate what temperatures were like 
hundreds, thousands, and millions of years ago. Because I see that there seems to be consensus, I think, even among the skeptics. Like if you showed some of these charts to the skeptics and the, what I like to call the hysterics, the people who think the sky is falling and the oceans are boiling, they tend to agree. You know, it's actually quite remarkable that there isn't much disagreement about what temperatures were like 100 million years ago which I find a little bit odd because, you know, we don't have reliable records from 100 million years ago or, you know, even 400 years ago um, to, to be able to tell with any kind of certainty about what the temperature was like and what the atmospheric CO2 was like. So what do you think of the quality of the evidence for these kind of very long-term graphs? I completely agree that the best you can do when you're going back in time, not very far in time, is uh, it's more of a guess than it is uh, precision. Because NASA says they don't even know the global average temperature right now. There's maybe uh, you might be off by a couple of your degrees Fahrenheit. So with all our modern technology, we don't really know what the global average temperature is. So if you're asking us what was the temperature on average on Earth of 500 million years ago today, uh, it's more of a guess than anything else. But they can use fossils and figure out if they can if they can find a, a tropical fossils way up by the poles, etc. And uh, like under the Antarctic ice, there's uh, evidence of life under there. So it must have been way warmer a long time ago there. But uh, I agree with you. If you're trying to uh, specify exactly either how much CO2 was out there or exactly what the temperature was, I don't think anybody knows. Especially, uh, I wanted to mention with uh, trying to figure out carbon dioxide, some people think that at the poles, if you just uh, take an ice core and you get uh, ice that you think is 800,000 years old and uh, find an air bubble in there and it, you're supposed to be able to tell how much CO2 was in the air globally using that ice bubble. I, uh, I don't have faith that you're getting the correct answer there either. So I think a lot of this old stuff is guesses. Yeah, and I think, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the estimates from some temperature are obtained from estimating CO2 concentrations and then assuming temperatures must follow some kind of relationship with CO2, right? There is a, yeah, there is a lot of uh, assuming that CO2 is the climate control knob, so it must have been warmer when CO2 was higher, but... Uh, that is not the case. I have a different slide. I think I can step back to it of a Greenland right here. This is a really good one from Greenland. Uh, up here, uh, the blue line at the top is uh, temperatures in Greenland. The red line at the bottom is uh, CO2, uh, global CO2. And um, you can see that throughout for thousands of years, the carbon dioxide is going up while the temperature is more is going down. So this whole idea that CO2 is the climate control knob, there's all sorts of exceptions. Sometimes it's going up when, when the temperature is going up, but a lot of times it's not. So there's all sorts of other things that are happening. And just assuming that uh, if you know the CO2, you know the temperature, it's just no way. You don't. Yeah. But so to, to get back to the temperature, uh, the historical temperature. So, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's reasonable to be skeptical about this data. I think uh, I agree with you on that. But we do know for a fact that fossils exist in the Arctic. We've seen fossils in the Arctic and you don't see a lot of living creatures today. So it's pretty clear that things were much warmer at a certain point in time back then. And we also have historical records from a few hundred years ago. Uh, where, you know, things like the, the Thames River in London used to freeze. Uh, so this, this is well documented. People have written about it. It used to happen every winter that the Thames would freeze. Now it never happens. And no matter how cold it gets in London, we haven't had the Thames freeze in what is it in like 200 years or 300 years or so? Something like that. I really enjoy yeah. the type of evidence also where uh, they find tree stumps that are only maybe a few thousand years old that are north of the current tree line up in the Arctic. I, I like that type of evidence because there you're not modeling or making any assumptions. You're actually physically looking at a tree stump and it must have been warm up there, warmer up there for that to happen. And then also uh, those uh, historical records from Greenland, farming in Greenland. And I have heard that there are some areas that are melting out now and you can still smell uh, a sheep smell from the uh, sheep farms that used to be there. And then they were covered with ice and uh, now it's warming up enough to, to, uh, unearth some of that stuff. Okay. So what you'd say is, you know, if you look at this chart, and, and by the way, we're going to have all of these charts uh, available. If you're listening to the podcast and you can't uh, tell what we're talking about, we're going to have all of these charts available on the show notes on safedeen.com slash podcast. And um, uh, under this episode, you'll find all of these uh, charts. So you can um, take your browser there right now and follow along as we discuss these uh uh, these graphs. And um, so 
so, so we we are warming. I think so you agree that the Earth is warming. The Earth today is a lot warmer than what it was a couple of hundred years ago, right? A few hundred years ago. Well, maybe not a lot, but it is yeah, yep. warmer than what it was a few hundred years ago. Yep. We know that, right? And it, it depends on which starting point you use. It's clearly warmer than it was in 1850 right now, and it's warmer than it was in 1975 right now. But uh, if you go back far enough, uh, of course, uh, for hundreds of millions of years, it's cooled since then. Um, so you can pick various points, and it's both war warmer than some of those points and colder than some of them. But lately, it uh, has been uh, warming. But uh, even in the last five years, it's unclear whether possibly we might be starting a short-term cooling trend again. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen next, but possibly we are starting to cool. It's, it's important to remember that nobody knows what's going to happen with the weather more than five days away from now. Uh, you know, your, your weather forecast will tell you everything after five days is basically guesswork. Um, so <laughs> to be able to, you know, confidently make assertions about what's going to happen in 50 and 100 years from now, I think is, um, it's one of those things that, you know, you have to either be uh, getting paid to do those things or to have a lot of trust in the people that uh, get paid to do those things and to imagine that these people are somehow infallible to be able to make these estimates. But if you actually look into the methodology for it, and I've uh, looked at that uh, to some extent, it's it's modeling at the end of the day. And these people are just looking at models and trying to predict the future from the models. And, you know, that doesn't have much of a better track record than uh, crystal balls as, um, as far as, you know, actual track record and not just um, going by credentials and titles. Yeah. Yeah. A point I would like to make is that not only do we not know what these graphs are going to like look like in the future, we don't know what caused the graphs to look like this in the past. There's all sorts of fluctuations there, and we can make guesses as to exactly what caused them, but the Earth's climate is so complicated that I, nobody understands it. We can have some general idea, but it's, there's a lot of surprises out there. So uh, yeah. the whole idea of trying to model Earth's climate, it's uh, not something we can do successfully right now. Yes, we're going to get to that in, por in point number four. But uh, yeah, let's, let's get to the second point, which is we are experiencing a climate crisis. Why aren't we experiencing a climate crisis, you heretic? We are not experiencing it. Uh, there's no uh, evidence at all that there's anything wrong with the weather that hasn't been wrong with it uh, every other year in human history. Uh, yeah, hurricanes are not getting worse. Fires are not getting worse. We're getting better reporting. We might be finding out about more fires now. If you live in a certain city in the old days uh, and a fire happened halfway around the world, you would never know about it. So now we, you, you can... Uh, get a lot of reporting. And if you listen to all the fire news every day, you might think the world's on fire, but it's not. And if you look at uh, graphs in a particular location of over 100 years, how bad are the fires now versus back then? Uh, there's no crisis there. And I've been down every one of these rabbit holes uh, for 15 years. I've carefully looked at the real data uh, versus the claims, and there, there's nothing alarming going on at all right now. Uh, a big uh, problem is people don't realize how bad the weather was in the past, and uh, they just figure if something bad happened today, that must it must be unprecedented. But none of it is. Yeah, yeah and I think mm -hmm. the, the confidence with which people who are 20 years old or 30 years old will tell you that, you know, we've never seen anything like this it always amuses me. I mean, you know, you've only been around for 30 years. You remember 20 of these years, maybe, if you're lucky. And the idea that, you know, um, the last 19 years should have experienced, should have shown you all of the possible variation in climate outcomes that would have ever existed so that, you know, something new happening in your 20th year is somehow um, conclusive proof that the earth is witnessing something uh, cataclysmic, I think is just... Uh, <laughs> It's, just, it's funny, really. Once you, once you step back from the kind of uh, you know group think around this, and you think about it, I mean, you know, the, the the world has been very, very different. As we said, there used to be trees above the tree line, you know, and and um, the tree line is the northernmost point on Earth where trees grow. Beyond that point, it's too cold for trees to grow. But historically, trees grew there, and. Um, we've had all kinds of different things that we know about, as a matter of fact, from the historical record of people writing it down and uh, all kind of other pretty solid evidence. So this notion that anything happening today is um, 
is, is extraordinary or a crisis in any sense, I think is, is, is absurd. And I think you're absolutely correct on the issue of reporting. You know, uh, 300 years ago, nobody lived in Florida or very few people kept records about what was going on in Florida. And so when a hurricane hit Florida, it was just a bunch of rain on an empty swamp. And, uh, you know, a bunch of crocodiles might have been bothered by it, but they didn't keep track record and they <laughs> didn't write uh, emotional diatribes about how this is the fault of uh, people burning firewood or whatever. But now we've got tens of millions of people living in Florida. And so when a hurricane hits, and, and of course, the reason we have tens of millions of people living in Florida is because of all the technological advancement that we have. And so um, Florida has become habitable. We, we, we found ways of getting rid of the crocodiles. We found ways of putting air conditioning there. And so now when, it, when you get a hurricane in Florida, it's a big deal. It destroys the lives of people. And it, yes, it's a terrible thing. But the notion that it is some kind of crisis that has never happened before, I think, is just... Uh, is outlandish. What would you say are the uh, best, what is the kind of strongest evidence that um, people who believe in a crisis would present? Like what, what are the kind of things that they tell you to try and prove to you that it is indeed a crisis? Well, I, I see that all the time on Twitter and in the, in the news is that uh, like flooding, there's flooding in Australia lately, uh, heavy, heavy rains. And they're saying, of course, because the air is warmer, it holds uh, 7% more moisture, and that's why it's raining so much. But these are the same people that two years ago, when everything was, or when they were having big fires down there and droughts, they were saying that carbon dioxide is the reason that it didn't rain enough. So just uh, constantly there's uh, contradictory claims like that. But I, I would say the biggest thing that I see is just something, just something bad happened, and carbon dioxide must have caused it. Heat waves, et cetera. Uh, yeah, they haven't dug very deeply or, or thought very deeply about the claims. And yeah, the floods and droughts uh, in the same area are blamed on uh, carbon dioxide. I, I, I don't understand why uh, we should buy into that one, but that's a common this one. Is the, yeah. the, the, this is one of my favorite things about following your Twitter account, which is, I mean, most people just don't think about those things these this way, but you just put it out there in a way that really makes you think. Um, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when it was droughts that were going to be, the, you know, obviously the science is settled. More CO2 is going to lead to magical things happening in the atmosphere, and then we get droughts. And then we get floods, and, you know, rain, uh, floods happen because there's a lot of rain, so it's the exact opposite. But there's very little difficulty in um, noticing the contradiction here. You know, either CO2 is going to cause the rain to stop falling or and we get a lot of droughts, or it's going to cause the rain to increase. It can't really do both. Um, you have to really engage in a lot of very, very elaborate mental gymnastics to convince yourself that whether it uh, w whether it rains a lot or it rains too little, the answer is because of CO2. And it's just... This is where it turns into really uh, witch doctor territory. It's 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 unfalsifiable. There's you know the weather's always going to change. There will always be a place in the world that is getting um, that, that is recording a record in rain. You know we record there are tens of thousands of cities around the world. There are hundreds of thousands of um, stations where people are recording rainfall levels and uh, temperature. And every year, you're bound to get records in uh, some of these. It's just inevitable. You're going to have to have, you know, records are set at some point. And so every year, records are going to be set. You're going to get most rainfall, least rainfall, highest temperature, lowest temperature. And as long as these records get set, then, um, you know, this kind of pseudoscience will take them as evidence. You know, there we go. You just find one of these many cities anywhere in the world, you know, it could be in China, Australia, um, Bolivia, whatever it is, you know, they had more, more rain this year than they ever have. And so that settles it. Or, you know, they had less rain this year than they ever had. Both of these things are enough to convince the believers that <laughs> this is a crisis. <laughs> yeah, I do like to point out a record cold just for fun on Twitter. I mean, you've probably seen that quite a few times. Uh, I do point that out all the time. Then people who, whenever there's a heat wave, they say this must prove that the earth is too hot. And I say that we have a, a cold wave. And then they'll say that's just weather. Of course, that doesn't mean anything. And it's back and forth all the time. I, I kind of enjoy it, but it's uh, not convincing. Anyway, no, no crisis. Yeah.
Yeah, actually, that's uh, let's take a little bit of a detour to talk about the um, climate versus weather dichotomy. So basically, when it's 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 hot and uh, it, it's it, it's it, it goes along with global warming, then that's the climate. But when it's cold, it's just the weather, right? <laughs> yep, I've heard that so many times. Yep. So what what is the difference between climate and weather? Could you explain the difference between the two? Well, a standard definition seems to be that it's climate uh, over a 30-year period, then it's climate. You know, over uh, shorter periods, then it's weather. That's the most common uh, definition I've heard. Um, I was going to mention that when you are talking earlier that I'm old enough to remember the 1970s um, global cooling scare. That There really was a, a scare in the media. I don't know what the scientists necessarily were saying, but for sure in the media there was a lot of talk about how uh, Earth was cooling, because it was, and it was uh, very cold, and uh, they were extending that off into uh, the future. Was, uh, an ice age was coming. That turned out to be wrong. But it was cold enough in the 70s so that in Ohio, there were people that were snowmobiling and uh, right past the um, chimneys of houses. It got, uh, it, it did really, really uh, get much colder in the 70s, and, uh, but then it turned around, and no one knows exactly why, but it was not humans that caused the cooling or the warming. It was something else. Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with you on that. All right, so the third one, the third flawed assumption is that the weather is getting worse. Why do you think the weather's not getting worse? Yeah, you can look at, uh, you, I like to take each one of those uh, one at a time, like hurricanes. You can look at all the records we have of hurricanes and uh, the accumulated energy of hurricanes, et cetera, and they're just not getting worse. The uh, a lot of uh, major hurricanes hit the U.S. in the 1950s for some reason. And again, no one knows why. But the hurricanes we've had since then, uh, we, ha we haven't had a spate of hurricanes like we did in the 50s recently. So the hurricanes are not getting worse. I have a slide here someplace of uh, the deadliest storms in human history. I like this one a lot. The 35 deadliest tropical cyclones. So you can see there's, if you look at the deaths column on the right, there was horrible cyclones that killed hundreds of thousands of people. But if you look at the years that they happened, like 1970 is one of the most recent ones. 1737, you had a really bad one in 1584. You go down here to 1281, there was a terrible one. And of course, a lot less people were alive back in 1281. And there's a lot of them that happened in the 1800s. So um, the whole idea that uh, if a storm kills uh, 10 people now, a lot of uh, people try to say, look, uh, there's, there's a climate crisis because we had a storm that killed 10 people. And it, it is an absolute tragedy, but the storms in the past were just so terrible also. And there, there's no signal in the, the storms that would indicate that uh, that uh, a hotter, it is a warmer climate. Does that cause bigger storms? Not necessarily. Some people argue that uh, as the earth warms and there's less of a difference between the poles and the equator, that possibly storms might get to be less intense and they might get more intense if we've got global cooling. And that's a theory, and I don't know which one is right. I, I, uh, I, think, it, I think it's possible that if we were to get uh, one degree centigrade of cooling from here, we might see some signal in storms getting slightly worse. But uh, certainly they're not getting worse. If you look at the actual data, um, they are not getting worse. And that, that's true of so many other things. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, and I think you know the, the key point which um, Alex Epstein always uh, makes uh, is what he calls climate mastery. I think this is something that is ignored, um, and and Alex Epstein really makes a very compelling case for the import. And when we've had Alex on this show a couple of times before, Alex makes a very compelling case for why you know even putting aside all of the um, uh, scientific evidence about what is actually happening on happening with the climate, the case for um, using fossil fuels uh, is enormously compelling, uh, regardless of what you think of the evidence, because the reason that uh, storms and cyclones don't kill as many people as they would have killed before is because of all of the incredible and amazing and previously unthinkable technologies that we use to build our modern world and our infrastructure. And that is largely thanks to fossil fuels. And I think, you know, the, um, the biggest blind spot that uh, climate fanatics, climate change fanatics have is that they ignore just, um, they, they think it's, you know, the metaphor that I like to use is they think changing the energy sources that humanity uses is a design choice, like changing the color of your iPhone. You know, it's just, it, it, it's like if we could only stop using black iPhone cases and all switch to white iPhone cases, we could fix the weather. 
and it's it, it's I think a testament to just the level of naivety and ignorance particularly among the very educated, because it's usually university graduates and um, even, you know, PhDs who have this enormously, enormously simplistic view of the world, wherein, you know, if we would just uh, switch off the supply of gas, coal, and oil, and substitute it with wind, solar, and angel farts or something, then we could just stop the weather from going bad. And of course, this misses the point that, you know, if, you, if you've got any kind of engineering background, you're an engineer, and I studied in, as an engineer, and I think, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I'd like to um, ride the coattails of engineers and call myself one because I appreciate engineers a lot and I like the engineering way of thinking. You can't just have the nice things that fossil fuels make possible without fossil fuels. We can't have steel reinforced houses without producing steel. And we can't just produce steel with seventh century technology that is windmill. You know, we, we I mean, we could, but we can't, um, we can't make anywhere near as good the steel that we have uh, with that technology. You look at how steel is produced, it involves enormous quantities of coal. So you may not like coal, you may not appreciate that it is, you know, it produces smog. Um, but you know, you don't have to live in the coal plant. Uh, you can move away from a coal plant if it's right next to you. But you do like I promise you that you do like the products that coal makes possible. Your iPhone wouldn't be possible without the coal, your laptop, um, semiconductors, all of these things that uh, you take for granted today cannot be made with solar technology. Solar panels themselves cannot be made with solar technology. Wind turbines cannot be made with uh, wind turbine technology or with sun rays. You need high power energy sources that produce an enormous amount of power and direct it towards solving, uh, the, toward, you know, forging that uh, iron. And so having those fuels allows us to have those houses that can survive a lot of these things that would have killed your ancestors uh, 500 or 5,000 years ago. And so um, whether the weather is actually getting bad or not, whether we are in a climate crisis is one thing. Even if that were true, you would want to use more and more uh, fossil fuels because that's our only hope of protecting ourselves from worse weather. If it's gonna mean more cyclones, if it's gonna mean more flooding, more snow, you're going to need sophisticated machinery, you're going to need um, heavy infrastructure, you're going to need modern sewage systems and modern water drainage system. And that can't be done without these um, energy sources that these people like to vilify so much, um, usually using those energy sources. You know, my, my, my constant um, response to all of those people is I'll consider your opinion when you're able to tweet it to me. <laughs> without using any fossil fuel products until you can switch away from it. And then, of course, you see the, 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 the completely delusional mentality when they respond saying, well, we need government to pass laws that, um, you know, allow me to tweet <laughs> without using fossil fuel technology. You know, if they would only just pass a law, then all those greedy capitalists would you know build their computers out of solar wind and um, angel farts and then i could tweet at you but it's not my fault and that's why that's mm -hmm. why we need yes. climate action <laughs> i do like uh, alex epstein's quotes about how um, fossil fuels haven't taken a safe climate and made it dangerous but they've taken a dangerous climate and made it safe i think that's an excellent quote because that's that's what's happening here Exactly. And I think there's a chart in my book, uh, The Fiat Standard, um, um, we'll put it in the show notes, I don't have it right now, that shows the number of people that have been dying um, because of uh, because of climate uh, related uh, disasters and catastrophes around the world. And um, also shows you the concentration of CO2. As CO2 is rising, oh yeah, you've got the same chart. I don't have the Great. CO2, but I just have uh, the blue line shows how the climate related deaths are plummeting. Yeah. Exactly. So over the last 100 years, we've seen an enormous, enormous number of uh, an, an enormous decline in the number of people dying from climate related deaths. 100 years ago, people a lot more people do died from floods, droughts, storms, wildfire and extreme temperatures. 
a lot less people die today because we have infrastructure. We have houses that withstand flooding. We have houses that uh, we have infrastructure that allows us to bring water into the middle of the desert in the middle of the drought. You know, um, people in people live in places today that were uninhabitable hundreds of years ago. And, you know, you have major modern cities in the middle of the desert, uh, millions of people living there. And even in the middle of the drought, they manage to get water there. And that's because of technological advancement. It's, uh, it, it's how we protect ourselves from the climate. And ironically and funnily enough, and coincidentally enough, this is what people think we need to get rid of in order to fix the weather. You know, we, they want to take away your ability to um, handle weather under some kind of uh, insane quest to appease the gods of the weather <laughs> to then make the weather become better. I think a lot of people with the propaganda they've heard, they think this blue line goes the other way. They think that uh, way more people are dying now than were dying 100 years ago. But um, again, if it's just a matter of looking at the data and then uh, it all falls away. It, it, the whole thing's a house of cards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's a house of cards and it also relies on a lot of emotional manipulation. And I think most of my listeners and most intelligent people have now come around to this conclusion that, um, you know, the uh, when it comes to, say, the, the, the corona crisis over the last couple of years, that, yes, a lot of this was just emotional and a lot of the evidence didn't require all this insane reaction that happened. And uh, I think people need to start seeing the uh, reality that uh, this is something that... Um, the supposed official science has done before. You know, they, we've burned witches before and we locked up five-year-old kids and muzzled them for a virus that doesn't threaten them and ruin their development and destroy the lives of millions of poor people. And I think we're seeing something similar with this uh, cl climate hysteria all over the world. I think it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's high time that people start considering the fact that uh, the cure... Uh, is far worse than the disease. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of the coronavirus, I think there was a, clearly there was a disease, and it was a bad disease for many people. But I think the cure was arguably far worse. Uh, the, the interventions that were done were far worse. In the case of climate, I think it's 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 arguable that there really isn't a disease that uh, we can't control the weather. That is just. You know, the, the, we're, the planet is far too big for us to be able to uh, think that we can determine what's going to happen with the weather. Which brings us nicely to point number four. And this is my favorite. And this is, I think, the first time I came across Tom's profile on Twitter. This was his uh, profile description, and it remains the uh, byline of his uh, blog. CO2 is not the climate control knob. This is, I mean, just simply hearing that sentence is just a massive uh, slap in the face. I'm like, yes, why would you think that CO2 is the climate control knob? I mean, the earth is an enormous, enormous place. The earth is a, is, is a massive ball whose diameter is 12,700 kilometers. That's a lot of kilometers. It's a huge thing. I don't, you know, you are only... One, uh, one over 500 of a kilometer. So that's 12,000 times 500 of you, roughly. Um, so you're extremely inconsequential as a human being. And even 7 billion of us are extremely inconsequential in, this, in, in the grand scheme of things. The Earth is enormous, and it's surrounded, uh, and, and it's spinning around a giant ball of fire in the middle of the sky. And... The notion that we could just set the temperature of this earth with CO2 is absolutely amazing. And why would anybody even believe that? Why would you think that this is the most important factor determining a temperature? So tell us more. Why is CO2 not the climate control knob? Yeah, this graph here that I showed before, it's uh, from a guy named uh, Bob Carter, the late Bob Carter. And I think it nicely lays out the, the fact that I mentioned before that uh, for long periods of time, the uh, temperature of the earth and CO2 can go in opposite directions. But I think it's mind blowing that you have some local city councils that they take it on that they're going to tackle the earth's climate. They're going to tackle the climate crisis. What they're trying to do is somehow change this red line. And that's supposed to change the blue line. And they're hoping that they're going to make a, an impact on uh, the global average temperature in 2050. But what I think is uh, everybody's efforts put together and all the money that's spent, et cetera, 
I, I'm highly doubtful that there will be any measurable impact on the weather or climate in 2050. Everything put together. You can spend trillions of dollars or uh, go all nuclear even, and I don't think there's going to be a measurable difference in 2050. Um, so because it's not the control knob, as you mentioned, there's all these other factors. I think solar factors are very are, are bigger, and uh, there's uh, ocean currents and all sorts of things are going on, volcanoes. And uh, the whole idea that it's the control knob is uh, there's no evidence for it. And we have a lot of evidence now of uh, CO2 levels and temperatures, and you, you can't see where the, as the CO2 levels change, the temperature uh, change as a result. Yeah. I think this is uh, th th this is I, I think the sun is the uh, major one and there are there are a bunch of uh, scientists who have written extensively about how it is the sun that is the main driver. What do you think of that? Uh, I agree. I think it's tremendously complicated. There's a uh, brilliant guy from Israel, uh, Nur Shaviv, I believe his name is. Um, he has uh, some some theories on how um, changes in the sun change cloudiness on Earth and. Um, I think that, from my perspective, is uh, one of the theories that's most likely to prove correct in the future. That changes in the sun uh, changes Earth's cloudiness, and that is a huge factor. Uh, that really uh, makes a big difference as to how warm it is on Earth. But uh, people who do the climate models, they admit that uh, we don't understand clouds and exactly how they're formed. And it's if we were to actually try to model uh, Earth's climate, we would have to know uh, how the clouds are changing, and we just don't yet. But I think the solar impacts on clouds are a big, big deal. Yeah, and I mean, you just need to stand in the sun and then watch a cloud come between you and the sun, and you immediately feel much colder. Like you'll you'll quickly see notice a several degree difference in temperature. So now, just imagine how significant that is on a planetary level, where cloud cover is just enormous. We have enormous amounts of clouds covering the Earth all over, um, and the sun hits those clouds. And, um, you know, it, if there's a lot of cloud, the Earth is going to get cooler. If there's not a lot of cloud, the Earth isn't going to, the Earth is going to get hotter. And it's just, I mean, if, if you snap out of the um, programming that wants you to think the CO2, I mean, just think about it. CO2 is just so tiny as a, a as a percentage of the atmosphere so and and this is something that people don't uh, get like uh, and I've, uh, p people think co2 is increasing and rising to these enormously dangerous levels but the reality is we're currently at 420 parts per million that's the concentration of co2 so every 1 million molecules in the atmosphere 420 of them are co2 so you look around, you know, the clouds are so enormous, the sun is enormous, all kinds of other things going on, the wind and the wind patterns and the currents. It, 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 it's, it's absolutely astounding that you would think that 420 parts per million CO2, and, and really all we're talking about, all of that has happened since the beginning of the industrialization is that we've gone from 280 parts per million to 420 which is really a very, very tiny, uh, you know, we've gone from very tiny to very tiny concentration. And the idea that this is going to um, affect the temperature of the earth more than the sun and the clouds and wind currents is just very, very, very difficult to, um, very, very difficult to, to believe logically. Wouldn't you agree? I, I absolutely would agree. And one fact I do like to bring up that as you and I are talking here, we're exhaling about 40,000 ppm of CO2. So it's a factor of 100 there. And the uh, around in my room right here now, there might be 3,000 ppm. Um, and uh, so it varies a lot. And I did want to mention, though, that um, even though the CO2 is not the control knob, it is really good plant food. And uh, when uh, people want to increase the uh, the rate of the which the plants grow in the greenhouse, they might put 1,500 parts per million of CO2 in, into the greenhouse. So uh, I think it, CO2's effect on Earth, uh, the greening of plants and the uh, increasing of crop yields is actually, th that's an actual uh, factor that you can measure. And uh, if you're tweaking it just to try to change the temperature, you're probably not going to be able to measure that. Yeah, and you, you did have a picture about that, a slide you wanted to show us about the uh, growing of uh, crops. Yeah, so here is an experiment done uh, growing trees at d different levels of carbon dioxide. The left side, the tree is short, uh, growing at a 350 ppm. And as you add more uh, parts per million, 
and I grow the same tree, it gets much bigger. So even at 800 parts per million on the right, the tree is way bigger. And of course, that applies for our corn and wheat and all sorts of our food crops. And uh, crop yields are way up, of course, over the last 100 years. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But the additional CO2 is actually part of the reason why the uh, crops are doing better. And the increased growing seasons are better, too. Yeah, I know. I know NASA in their on their website they have an article in which they uh, talk about how um, CO two is helping uh, uh, greening. But how strong is that evidence? How do we know that it is actually CO two that is helping? Couldn't it just be the fact that um, because we are modernizing industrialization, um, it's allowing us to concentrate in cities and then to spread out. Uh, a lot of the farm area and a lot of the rural land is being converted into forested land as a result of urbanization. Do you think that might be um, that might be the driver, or how convinced are you that CO two is actually helping? Because it's um, uh, you know, wouldn't you be skeptical of that claim too? Yeah, I would be skeptical of how much it's helping if they tried to say it's 75 percent. But it is a positive factor. I, I'm confident of that just because, uh, like I said, if you're growing plants in a greenhouse, you add additional CO2. And uh, somewhere here, uh, I might have a slide and I might not about uh, corn in a growing uh, cornfield. It sucks up all the available carbon dioxide uh, nearby. So if it in the morning, if there's 420 ppm out there in the cornfield, it might be down to 200 ppm because on a, on a day when the corn is growing, it's, it's sucking up carbon dioxide like crazy. It's a very big factor in uh, how fast the corn's growing. And um, I think Patrick Moore argues that our Earth CO2 uh, without humans was continuing to go from thousands of ppm. And as plants were sucking it up and it wasn't getting returned to the atmosphere, there's going to be less and less of it. And he argues that maybe the presence of humans has actually been a big deal in that we're uh, burning some fossil, we're burning fossil fuels and returning carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and getting that number up uh, to a higher level where, uh, where plants are doing better. I think if it gets down to 180 or so, a lot of plants really struggle. So it could be argued that uh, us putting that CO2 back there is, is uh, really helping. Yeah, um, we've had uh, Patrick Moore here, and he, he he did make that case, and I think it's uh, it's it's a pretty compelling case. I think um, you know, as you said, if CO two drops too low, we we're in trouble. We're gonna have a lot of trouble growing crops. So uh, it does seem like it is a good thing that the concentration of CO two increases. But um, I think the other thing that is interesting, and this is where I uh, I think you know recent evidence has just been absolutely um, fascinating about this. When how do we really know that it is our action that is increasing the concentration of CO two in the atmosphere? Um, so yes, we are emitting a lot of CO two because we're digging up a lot of hydrocarbon fuels from under the earth, and we're burning them and we're releasing them into the atmosphere. And it also happens to be that the uh, atmospheric concentration of CO2 is increasing. So the correlation is there, but um, how do we know that this is actually causal? Because um, I, it could well be the case that we our actions don't really determine the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And also, um, it could be the case that these are just natural cycles that take place around uh, the Earth and, you know, uh, maybe it is changes in the temperature, maybe it is uh, changes in the solar activity, um, maybe it is something about the Earth's trajectory or whatever that is causing these kind of changes in CO2 concentration, regardless of what we're doing. So that, uh, yes, we're emitting a lot of CO2, but the concentration of CO2 is going to find its way um, into settling into a certain uh, range, regardless of what we do, because... The Earth is extremely complex. The Earth's atmosphere and the biosphere is extremely complex. So, um, you know, the plants can absorb more CO2 or they can absorb less CO2. Um, it can get absorbed or it can escape the atmosphere, perhaps. All kinds of different things can happen, um, wherein our contribution ends up being completely insignificant. And the reason I think this is something worth considering, even though I don't find many people making this making this claim, um, we saw this two years ago when the global lockdowns happened. We had basically a shutdown of global aviation, which is an enormous contributor to CO2 emissions. And we had a shutdown of uh, car, uh, automobile uh, uh, 
emissions. So not total, obviously, you know, some airplanes, uh, cargo planes, and a lot of cars still moved around. But there was an enormously significant reduction in the amount of CO2 emissions taking place as everybody was locked at home. And yet you look at atmospheric concentrations and you don't notice any kind of effect. So there's a chart on uh, the, uh, which I also include in uh, the FIAT standard, um, where it shows that we don't really see any kind of effect. And you would imagine this kind of significant reduction in emissions would have an effect on atmospheric concentration. You know, you'd notice a little bit of a break in the trend of rising CO2 concentration, but we don't. So what do you think? Yeah, I think that is a great point that you bring up. And I actually do have uh, some of the same questions that you have about that. So not only is CO2 is not the climate control knob and humans might not be the CO2 control knob either. And there, I have seen some studies where uh, people did direct air measurements of carbon dioxide a long time ago, like maybe 1900 or before that. And a lot of these measurements that they, uh, they produced back then were surprisingly high. They're, they're supposed to be stable at 280 for a long time, and it was supposed to evenly go up to 420. But there's a lot of measurements back there that didn't fit that curve at all. And either those are, measurements are all wrong, or CO2 is doing something different than we think it's doing. So I think you make a very good point. And uh, we can't run the experiments again, run the last 100 years without any humans on Earth and see what CO2 does. But um, I would be not surprised if humans weren't here if uh, CO2, I don't think it would have just stayed exactly stable. I think it would have uh, possibly gone up without humans here. Um, there was a guy named Tom Segalstead, I believe, who talks about how uh, a lot of CO2 that's in the air ends up uh, forming into, I believe, calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate in the ocean and just falling to the bottom of the ocean. So there may be uh, other sinks that we're not really aware of. Uh, there, there's so many things happening with CO2 that's not just a matter of if humans emit more, then uh, it's going to stay in the atmosphere. Like, filling up a bathtub. It's not like that. If we admit it, uh, maybe more will get uh, sunk. And uh, the uh, anyway, that last 140 ppm might not be due to humans. They do say that they've done some isotope ch uh, testing and somehow using isotopes, they've pinned it on humans. But uh, that may or may, not, may or may not be true. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's fascinating. But I think, you know, here... Um, uh, you know the, the the onus of proof is not on the um, is not on the people who uh, are like you and me think there is no crisis. I think this is just another. Uh, it, it's adding more burden of proof on the people who think that there is a crisis because not only do you need to convince me that you know the weather is uh, irredeemably broken in a in a way that has never happened, but you also need to convince me that that is because of increasing CO two. And that the increasing CO2 is the fault of human beings. And I think, you know, if you just step out of the idea that credentials are what determines truth, and you're trying to think of this in a scientific way, you know, scientific as in scientific method, not scientific as in people who get called scientists because governments um, uh, pay them research grants to call themselves scientists, then I think the burden of proof is extremely, extremely uh, difficult to determine. So, um, it's and again, you know, when you throw in the on the opposite side, we're being asked to basically sacrifice the things that make modern civilization possible. It's it's very difficult to make the um, you know the, the 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 climate crisis case. I think. Um, all right, so that moves us then to number five, which is that climate science is basic physics. Is climate science basic physics or not? No, that, that's one of the craziest claims. I hear that all the time that it's basic physics. And again, they're assuming that if you just uh, add a certain amount of carbon dioxide to the air, you're going to be able to calculate the global average temperature. But anyway, as we've discussed already, there's so many different factors. The idea that you can just use basic physics to figure that out is ridiculous. And why are we even funding uh, climate science if it's basic physics? I've heard some say that the science has been, uh, the basic science of global warming has been settled since the 1800s. But um, it, it hasn't, of course. Like we were talking about, there's all these things going on with clouds and all the other uh, all the other factors. Um, so it, it clearly is not basic physics. It's, it's clearly tremendously complicated. Yeah, and I think the fact that you can um, illustrate the greenhouse effect in a greenhouse in a laboratory setting is one thing, but extrapolating from that to 
a giant ball that is 12,000 kilometers in diameter is a completely different thing. I mean, it's just the idea that you could reduce the entirety of the Earth's climate to the effect that you see in a tiny little um, in a tiny little uh, lab setting is just uh, unbelievably reductionist in a way that I don't think survives uh, any kind of scientific critical scrutiny. Yeah. And of course, even in a real greenhouse or an, in a hot car, it's not the actual, it's not CO2 that's causing it to heat up. It's, uh, it's the glass and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the glass heating up. It is not uh, CO2. There's been people who try to uh, change CO2 levels in inside a closed container. I think Anthony Watts has done some of these experiments. And uh, you can put more CO2 in there or less CO2, and, and you actually don't see a difference in temperature because of the CO2 inside of a closed container. So I have not seen any lab experiment where they can actually prove exactly. Uh, I do believe that the CO2 does trap some heat, but I haven't seen it proved in a lab in a lab experiment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it keeps getting flimsier and flimsier. It does. The more you look into it. Yeah. <laughs> I should mention at yeah. this point that when I first heard this stuff, I believed it. And lots of skeptics that I know started out believing it. They just thought, okay, scientists must know what they're doing. They must be correct. But it's very, very common that you believe it for a while. And then something makes you check into it for yourself. And then you become uh, you become very surprised that the evidence does not hold up at all. If you look at it uh, on your own for just an, a day, you can find out lots of different holes. Yeah, I think it's um, it, it, it's one of my uh, it's, it's one of the funny things I find about this uh, entire debate, and not just this debate, but I think you know generally the kind of people who think we're in a climate crisis also think that you know um, all of these insane government mandates on um, to fight a virus were a good idea, and it's just it's it, it's it's complete lack of critical thinking and uh, delegation to authority. And what I find amazing about it is that. Um, if you try and have a discussion with some of these people that are uh, convinced that we're in a climate crisis, it's extremely rare that they would even have an idea, that they would even consider the possibility that you've actually understood what they're talking about. And this is, you know, the, 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 um, the only image they have in their mind, the only idea is that you're simply ignorant because you haven't heard of the science. And this is, this is always, when you're dealing with any of these kind of midwits, they talk to you as if you're a 10 year old and you know, that you need things explained to you as a 10 year old. No, here's what you don't understand. Here's what the scientists say. The climate change is changing because of um, you know the greenhouse effect, and they they just they cannot conceive of the idea that you actually understand those things, that you've read about those things, that you've studied them more than they have studied those things, and you've come to disagree. For them, the only possible reason why you disagree with their TV and newspaper is because you're ignorant. That's it. Like there's no ability to conceive of your opponent's viewpoint. There aren't, I, I've not come across anybody who will, um, you know, the, the people that are really fanatic about this, they can't explain what it is that skeptics think. They can't tell you why you don't believe it. Like, if, you know, you, what they call this, um, I forget the name for it, you know, being able to summarize uh, your opponent's viewpoint. They cannot do that. You cannot, uh, I think it's called passing the, uh, what is it, the Turing test? No, not the Turing test, something else, I forget. So people call that steel manning. Steel manning, I've heard it called it. Yes, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. They could never provide a steel man. And that's, they could never tell you, you know, why, all right, so, They've heard that I, you know, that somebody will hear that I say something that is, you know, against the um, high priests of climate orthodoxy. And the only reaction I get is, oh my God, I can't believe this guy is such an idiot. He doesn't even know and doesn't believe in the science. And like, it's impossible for one of them to say, all right, I, this is what you think. You know, here's your position. You think, you know, the things that you and I have discussed right now, like, yeah, you think the weather is changing, but that it's not a catastrophe. And you don't think that CO2 is the control knob. And here's why you're wrong. They're incapable of providing that kind of summary. All that they can do is just, oh my God, I can't believe you don't believe the science. I can't believe you won't, you, you, you don't trust the scientific evidence. And it's just, you know, if only 
more people would mock you and laugh at you and force you to read more New York Times explainers and more NPR, uh, you know, uh, how, to, how to talk to your uh, climate skeptic friends. Uh, if only you would read more of these, you know, then you would become informed. And of course, the amazing thing is that the vast majority of those people um, don't read any science. What they consider science is basically NPR and New York Times explainers and uh, CNN uh, <laughs> uh, segments. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of them think that their job is done if they can convince you that the climate is changing, like they think skeptics don't believe the climate is changing, or if they can uh, get you to admit that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, which it is, uh, then they think they may have won the debate, or uh, all experts believe in it. I guess that's coming up next. Yep, uh, the, that's number six. <laughs> then it must be true if the experts believe it. Uh, but yeah, they've just, uh, as you mentioned, they just have never taken the time to actually look at anything for themselves. or. Yeah, the knowledge is a very, very thin. Yeah, so this is, this is a, of course, a very common one you always get, which is 97% of all climate scientists agree. And so who the hell are you to disagree with them? So do all the experts agree? Uh, they do not. I mean, the whole question is, do they agree on what? Uh, they probably all do agree that, they do agree that Earth has warmed since 1975 and 1850. I've never heard anybody say that it hasn't. And I've never heard any expert say that CO2 is not a, a greenhouse gas. I've never heard any expert say the climate isn't changing, but that's about as far as it goes. And But a lot of people think the consensus is that we are currently experiencing a climate crisis. And of course, the weather is getting worse and all these other things. They think the consensus extends way further than it really does. And that somewhere here, I should probably bring it up, is what the IPCC says about uh, storms, et cetera. This one, I like this one a lot. This is the IPCC from 2012. So oftentimes I'm dealing with people on Twitter and they're trying to tell me that the IPCC says that cyclones are getting worse. So at the top here, you can see the IPCC says there's low confidence in, it's what's, in what is happening with tropical cyclones. And further down, they're talking about droughts. And basically they say droughts have gotten worse in some places and they've gotten less severe in other places. You get down to the bottom, what does the IPCC say? What do they say about floods? And uh, overall low confidence at the global scale regarding even the sign of the changes of floods. So this whole time, over and over, we're hearing, of course, CO2 causes worse floods. And all, all scientists agree. But you look and see what the IPC says, and they absolutely don't say that. They say, we don't even know what's a sign. Maybe floods are getting worse or better, or we don't know. So um, bottom line is uh, the consensus does not uh, say what uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of warmest people think it says. Yeah, and and um, you know the, that ninety seven percent of climate scientists agree um, claim uh, is <laughs> dodgy as hell. Uh, I, I, what was it based on? Do you are you familiar with the study on which it was based? Yeah, I think it turned out there was a big survey sent out and to I don't know if it was thousands of people. They got it down for some reason to seventy five out of seventy seven had agreed. I think that was the ninety seven percent, but. I can't remember what the premise was. It for sure wasn't, do you do you all believe that there is a uh, climate crisis right now? And I would like to see all climate scientists in the world, I'd like to see a poll saying, and uh, they would have to reply and uh, provide their name or sign their name to a statement saying, it's 2022 and I believe that there's a cl global climate crisis right now. I think very few climate scientists would be willing to sign their name to that where they would... Uh, that have to be thrown back in their face uh, years from now, because there, for sure there is no climate crisis. And again, um, the number of people who are living as if they believe that, that's a big deal too. Uh, almost nobody is living as if they believe that CO2 threatens to kill our children. Yeah, even people who are on TV all the time trying to scare us about this, they are living fossil fuel lifestyles. And uh, if they actually believe that it threatened to kill their children, they would have to model that and, and not uh, be flying uh, flying off for vacation, etc. So they just can't be bothered to behave as if they believe what they're saying. I think it's an important point. Yeah. This this is another one of my favorite uh, uh, things about this uh, whole hysteria is, um, you know, whenever I speak about this, there's one particular uh, podcaster in the Bitcoin space who shall go nameless, who is um, very good at regurgitating, you know, uh, approved narratives, and um, he's always, you know feigning outrage of the fact that how could this guy say that there is no climate crisis? And he owns a sports car that does not run on wind or solar. 
and uh, well, even if it did run on Windows Solar, you can't make Windows Solar uh, power without extensive use of fossil fuels and extremely high carbon emissions. And he conducts all of his interviews. He tr he flies out to conduct all of his interviews rather than do Zoom, which you know consumes and emits an enormous amount of CO two. And of course, I have no problem with him doing the, all of those things. But I find it astonishing and hilarious that these people will tell you this is a crisis and they'll harangue you, you know, the, 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 this kind of hysterical shrewd, um, you know, how dare you say this? It's a crisis. You know, he has no problem with um, really degrading and humiliating himself by haranguing strangers on the Internet for not behaving like this is a crisis. But then he goes and gets into airplanes uh, to do things that can be done over Zoom, uh, gets into a sports car when he could just get on a bus, and <laughs> emits an enormous amount of CO2. And it's just, like, if, if you really think this is actually causing a crisis, you wouldn't be doing this. Like, if you, know, if you really believed this is a crisis, if you really believe this is going to, I don't know, whatever your claims are, whatever you've been programmed to believe recently, um, you know, cause sea levels to rise or boil the oceans or, you know, boil rising oceans or whatever it is, going to destroy the climate for your children, it's going to make earth unlivable for your children. You'd think twice about emitting all those CO2 emissions, but you don't see that. You don't see these people thinking in that way. They just, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's unbelievably funny for me how, you know, it's not about, it's, it's not something that will ever affect their own life and the way that they want to do it. It's just something with which they harangue others. And it's, it's the same thing with the coronavirus. You know, you see it with all of these, some of the, you know, all of the politicians that were the most um, fanatic about enforcing mask mandates and making children wear masks and enforcing all kinds of insane stuff about lockdowns. They were all, well, not all, but I mean, an enormously high number of them were caught, um, um, you know, flaunting their own rules. Like the, the British prime minister was throwing parties every couple of days um, when the entire country was in lockdown. Um, the California governor had a very high profile series of things. And it's, it's, it's amazing. And it, it just shows that this entire thing is just, uh, it's, it's just a stupid moral panic, <laughs> really. It's, it's, it's no different from burning witches. It's just, you know, um, dim-witted people get manipulated into getting angry. And this is where, you know, uh, one of the other counters is, well, wh how do you explain all of these scientists? Well, I don't have to explain why people believe ridiculous things. All throughout human history, people have believed all kinds of ridiculous things. It's not my responsibility to get inside the mind of ridiculous people who believe ridiculous hysterical things and provide you with a full accounting of why each one of them came to believe all of those things. Um, you know, people burned witches before. Uh, people have done all kinds of insane things. They used to sacrifice children in order to make the crops work. Um, these, are the, these are the same human beings that, uh, you know, the, their own genetic material is passed on today to the people that are deciding to uh, mask two-year-olds. And they believe two-year-olds need to stay in masks, even as their political leaders themselves are not masking. It's not up to me to justify it. The fact that they're de choosing to do insane things <laughs> is, <laughs> is not an argument in favor of those insane things. Um, and also, you know, going back to the issue of the experts, a lot of these studies that look at it, what they do is they look at all the studies that are published with climate change in them, and they see if that study is actively going out there and denying climate change. And then if not, you know, even if it's just a tiny little uh, footnote that in which it mentions climate change, the fact that it's not denying it. Then they'll say you, oh, oh yeah, you've got you've got this uh, right here. You've got the data. So tell us about this. Yeah, here's uh, just where my cursor is. Here they have uh, close to twelve thousand climate papers, uh, and only zero point three percent of them actually found fifty percent of the warming since uh, six fifty percent of the post nineteen fifty warming was caused by humans. But a thing I like to mention here is that. Uh, Lately, or in recent years, if you're uh, doing butterfly research and you want to get funding, uh, you can get more funding if you mention I'm uh, doing uh, working on the effects of climate change on butterflies. That'll get you funding. So enormous amounts of papers have been written that mention climate change, but they just mention it. And certainly, 
uh, this butterfly researcher in the example is not actually looking at all the factors and trying to figure out how the Earth's climate works. Most, almost all these papers, they just mention climate change and it's by people who don't, uh, they're, they're not trying to figure out uh, the human influence. They're just trying to figure out uh, if warming happens, what will happen to my uh, research subject. So, yep. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to get published, you want to uh, tie in climate change. There's an amazing uh, web page, which I also cite in my book, The Fiat Standard, which says um, the title of the page is Everything is Caused by Climate Change. And it collects press articles that link all kinds of things to climate change. And it's because, you know, some study, again, somebody was studying the population of um, butterflies in the Himalayas. And in order to get a research grant to go hang out in the Himalayas for a couple of months, they said a couple of sentences on, you know, studying the impact of climate change. And that then is presented as a scientific paper that confirms that climate change is happening and also presented as an impact. You know, if you are, if you're a denier, then <laughs> you want the butterflies of the Himalayas to go extinct, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So these are the big six uh, myths. I think this is this has been perfect. And I, you know, I, I look forward to seeing um, people try and poke holes in these. Um, now, after that, we get to the IPCC. I wanted to ask you, what do you think of the IPCC? I mean, these are, you know, uh, it's a government agency. So clearly they would never uh, have any kind of conflict of interest or they would never um, make dubious claims. It's an international organization. It's part of the United Nations. How dare you, as our glorious leader, uh, leader Greta Thunberg says, how dare you uh, question them? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... It's presented as uh, the gold standard or whatever, but it's the intergovernmental panel on climate change. So they, when they are uh, producing the summary for policymakers, they get in a room in a closed door room and they negotiate it, which is really an odd way to do science. Uh, that you're in a closed door room and then you don't, you don't really negotiate what the scientific truth is, but that's what they do. They go through line by line, some uh, government employees, and, and then what's supposed to come out of that process is scientific truth after they negotiate it. But I think that's a total farce. So um, there are a lot of good people, I'm sure, that work for the IPCC. But I uh, don't. Uh, it's it's not truth with a capital T. It's just a bunch of people that are saying some stuff, and some of it's true, and some of it isn't. Yeah, it's um, and and I think there's a, there's an enormous difference between um, you know what the scientists say in these, and then what gets uh, put in the executive summary, and then what gets reported in the press. Yeah. And uh, a lot of scientists have had a lot of misgivings about their work being misrepresented in this uh, stuff. So it is like a, a game of telephone, the kids game telephone, where you have real scientists writing papers. And then there's a level where they write the summary for policymakers, which may contradict possibly what's in the basic level or the lower level. And then uh, just recently, when they came out with one of their reports, I think it was the uh, UN chief said it's a code red for humanity. So that was presented as an IPCC conclusion, and it's just something that uh, a guy, which uh, I think I think it was Antonio, I forget, it was the head of the head of the UN. But anyway, none of the scientists said code red, as far as I know. But since he said code red, that's what got in the headlines, and that was just uh, again uh, not a scientific claim at all. It's just something that somebody said, totally not true, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um... And um, all right. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is the hockey stick. This became pretty famous. Um, and I think, you know, when I think the the moment that um, the climate crisis narrative uh, triumphed was probably around um, the mid 2000s, somewhere around 2004, 2005, 2006. That's when uh that's when basically you became a pariah for questioning any of this stuff. And that's when I think, you know, that's when George Bush was running for re-election and then he basically bought into this, even though I think, I may be inaccurate here, but I think when he ran for elections first time, this was not a big deal. And then uh, when he ran for re-election, it was a big, uh, he, he wasn't much uh, of a believer, but then when he ran for re-election, he basically switched into it. And I think that was the point where, um, if you wanted to be taken seriously, if you didn't want to get pointed at and laughed at, you had to um, 
admit that it was real. And that happened largely, I think, or a big part of it was because of the Al Gore movie that came out uh, around that time, which was An Inconvenient Truth. And a big part of that movie, like the big main takeaway of that movie was when Al Gore got into that elevator. Um, You know, he was walking around showing you the temperatures. And then he to show how the temperatures have risen recently, he got into an elevator that took him up and showed how the ele- uh, temperatures were rising. So the whole thing was, um, you know, very, uh, th- very dramatic. And that's really, I think, when also it, it was when the climate narrative had a very coherent um, single story. And I should add, you know, I, I, I used to be a believer. Like I, I studied this stuff at a graduate level. I have a PhD on this stuff and I, uh, I was a believer and this was pretty convincing at that point. Like, you know, uh, we've had witnessed an enormous amount of increase in the temperatures as soon as, um, right, you know, pretty coincidental with the beginning of industrialization. So as soon as we start uh, pumping these fuels out of the earth, we start putting out carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we witness temperatures rising massively in a way that was unprecedented. And it's, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to argue that this was a coincidence. But then um, things happened that showed that that data had a lot of problems with it. So what happened with the, this hockey stick? Yeah, Steve McIntyre is the one that really investigated the hockey stick and how they try to use proxies uh, to figure out what the global average temperature had done. But the the whole idea, I think, is pretty farcical to try to use tree rings to figure out what the global average temperature was because there's so many uh, things that influence the width of tree rings, like amount of rain or there was even uh, like a uh, sheep may have uh, defecated near the tree and that could make a big difference if there's additional fertilization there that uh, that could make you think that uh, that was an extra warm year, et cetera. But uh, I put up the uh, slide here just showing um, the uh, way the temperatures have varied over the last few thousand years. And the hockey stick kind of threw away all of these uh, warm periods, et cetera. And it's just supposed to be replaced by kind of a flat line that they um, – it was a flat line and then humans started burning fossil fuels and then they, you got the blade of the hockey stick going kind of straight up. But it kind of wrecks the whole uh, narrative if you look at all the different warm periods that occurred just in the last few thousand years when CO2 was supposed to be stable and we weren't, weren't burning fossil fuels. So why did we get all of these uh, fluctuations? And you can see that some of these rises of temperature, if this graph is correct, uh, thousands of years ago, from the European Dark Age, the medieval warm period, there's quite a ri- rise there that's kind of like the rise that we just saw um, after the Little Ice Age. So th- the hockey stick, in my mind, is completely bogus and discredited. And there's been tons of papers that have come up with um, temperature reconstructions that don't look anything like uh, Michael Mann's hockey stick. So um, not correct. It got, I think it got a lot of uh, attention because uh, it uh, fit fit the narrative and it could be used, but uh, it's not correct. It's not scientifically correct. Yeah, and I think the um, the, the, the other thing that happened was that um, uh, as it became very clear that this data wasn't very good, you know, we witnessed the pivot in uh, the messaging from uh, global warming to climate change. So it used to be that it was a coherent narrative that, you know, CO2 rises, temperatures rise, and then the earth boils and burns and we all die and, uh, and it gets horrific. But then it became, first of all, we didn't witness the warming that they were predicting. And it became clear that, uh, you know, the, the data, the idea that this was so unprecedented wasn't really there. And so they pivoted the marketing from warming to change and now you know once you move to change that's that's when we get into real proper uh, witch doctor territory because everything is changing in the climate at all times you know we're talking about a giant ball that is spinning <laughs> in the earth that is uh, spinning in the in, in in space at a speed of 30 kilometers per second around an even far bigger giant ball of fire And, um, you know, nothing is going to be constant. We've got everything changes every day and over the um, over the seasons and over the years, everything is constantly changing. And so, of course, our observed experience of temperature and weather and rainfall is going to constantly be changing. And 
Any change that happens can be construed as evidence for this. Interestingly enough, of course, uh, there's been quite a little bit of shenanigans uh, involved in the construction of the hockey stick. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I know Stephen McIntyre has done a lot of work on this. I've been trying to get him on the podcast, and he promised he would uh, join us uh, in a few months. Um, his work was very influential in me uh, breaking out of this. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I was doing my PhD in this stuff when I came across his blog, and it's extremely challenging. Yeah, it's super interesting. I, he is a very smart guy. I love to read his work, and he found out that I believe if you take man's algorithm and you put red noise through it, just random red noise, a hockey stick pops out from his algorithm. And uh, I believe also that there was some certain bristlecone pine tree that showed uh, that showed the hockey stick that man wanted, and that was weighted something like it was hundreds of times more than some other than some other proxies. So um, it's basically look around until you find something that gives the answer you want and uh, just use that and throw out the other data. There was a lot of that type of thing. And there was also the hide the decline thing where the data did not show, uh, the tree ring data didn't show what the temperature uh, uh, temperature showed from I think 1960s, I forget when it was, but there was a big divergent between uh, what temperature showed in the tree ring. So they just threw that out and uh, they, uh, they, hide, they hid the decline shown by the tree ring data because uh, if uh, trees are not thermometers uh, after 1960, how do we know they were ever thermometers? And the answer to me is they were never thermometers. They were just, uh, yeah. it, none of that data makes any sense to me. Yeah, and of course, uh, you know, Stephen McIntyre is um, uh, is an independent researcher. He's also not part of the uh, he's not part of the accredited approved uh, priests of climate, so he shouldn't be uh, he, he, you know he shouldn't be talking about this. And of course, you know the interesting thing is, of course, <laughs> he's uh, he spent years trying to look into the raw data for this, and people were stonewalling him and just refusing to give him the access to the data. And then one day, uh, somebody hacked into some servers, and they managed to liberate that data. And this is this is, I think, of course, another one of the major blind spots that people think, well, there's a real scientific process taking place. No, it's almost all of it is, or well, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it, particularly the most influential stuff, is done with proprietary data that you can't verify. You can read the science, which is you know the paper that gets published in a journal with the conclusions, but you can't look at the raw data. And if you try and look at the raw data, you know the the scientists will just tell you, no, you can't do it. You have to be part of the guild. You have to be publishing. Um, basically, you have to have your livelihood dependent on reaching the correct conclusion in order to access the data. And so that's really how they prevent real scrutiny. But Steve McIntyre has done an incredible job uh, doing that scrutiny. And after years of being uh, turned down and being refused access to that data, uh, some enterprising <laughs> uh, hackers uh, liberated that data along with a trove of emails uh, of some of those scientists involved, particularly to the um, particularly associated with uh, the East Anglia University. And uh, that showed uh, pretty blatant evidence of transparent data manipulation in order to arrive at the desired results, right? Yeah, I spent uh, many hundreds of hours reading those uh, emails. It was super interesting to me. I blogged about it thousands or hundreds of times I blogged about it. And uh, it was very interesting to see what the scientists were saying to each other when the when they thought nobody else would be able to, uh, these are private conversations. So what they were saying privately was very different from what they were saying publicly. I think there was one email in there where uh, a guy said that a local kid did a uh, project about tree rings that kind of uh, invalidated the entire tree ring idea. He used some tree rings from a local woods and it kind of invalidated the uh, the idea that you can use tree rings to figure out glow, figure out temperatures, which which you really can't. But there was all sorts of very interesting stuff in there, and uh, I'm very glad that we have access to those. So um, I still have a lot of those. If anybody wants to take a look at my blog, I have tons of posts on that. It's uh, a lot of good stuff is in there. Uh, lamenting cold weather, and uh, we can't figure out why it's so cold, that type of thing. Very interesting. I don't know if you've read some yourself, maybe. 
Um, yeah, I've uh, I, I've uh, looked into this over the years. I'd urge I'd urge the reader and listener to uh, look into this stuff firsthand. I think um, the if you're not getting paid to arrive at these conclusions, the more you research, the more you head in the direction of yeah, there's no crisis and we should stop freaking out about this. I think in general, people should just stop freaking out about (laughs) things and start being a lot more reasonable about them. Um, All right. Well, this has been uh, uh, this has been great. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Now I want to open this up for questions from the seminar attendees. Anybody here have any questions for Tom? Um, I could ask a question. Um, so, yeah. so I just wanted to ask a question about the uh, global temperature records related to the first uh, chart you showed on Greenland average temperatures. Yeah. Um, there's quite a lot of contention around that particular graph because people say that um, people have tried to debunk it by saying that this is only a local uh, temperature change and that it was taken on the surface of Greenland rather than um, like showing a cross section of, of different temperatures. And um, I just wondered how you respond to claims that this is only a regional change and that actually, in reality, the, um, the, the, the average global temperature um, was, was much lower. Yeah, I would say that if CO2 is a climate control knob, it should have been able to heat Greenland over a thousand year period. It would be odd if Greenland went one way and they, the rest of the world went the other way over six, maybe 7,000 years or more. Um, I have not seen a graph showing global average temperatures going the other way a lot in lockstep with uh, carbon dioxide over that same period. So I think uh, pretty much any temperature proxy is going to show you, uh, if it was correct, it would show you something locally. And uh, But yeah, I have seen a lot of that, uh, particularly about whether the medieval warm period was global. That seems to be one of the biggest questions. But there is a great website I would direct people to called the, uh, I think it's called the Medieval Warm Period Project where they spent enormous amounts of time looking at all sorts of uh, data to find out, was the medieval warm period just a local thing or was it a global thing? And uh, there's tons of studies that indicate they've looked at all sorts of local areas and it seems like it occurred in, in most local areas. And um, it looks like it was about as warm as it is now. Uh, so the hockey stick would have you believe that the medieval warm period was colder than now. And, and uh, I see no evidence that it was colder than now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kiki, you want to ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Safe. Yeah, I have a question, Tom, and thank you for joining us today. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you find is the best way to begin this conversation with climate, typical climate people, especially around Bitcoin mining, if you know anything about that or just how the best way in uh, to talk with people who might be new to this information? Yeah, I'm not sure about the Bitcoin mining part, but... Uh... For me, I like to just uh, divide it up into parts. I really like to just look at one piece of it at a time. So uh, I like to debunk one piece, like if they uh, start talking about how a hurricane just happened and that must prove that there's a crisis, then I just dive down right into that. I don't know if that helps any, but that's just the way my mind works is I like to look at small pieces at a time and debunk the claims one at a time. But um, I don't know if you're interested in any, uh, any books you could read to get started on this? Those are at the end. I wanted to throw that up here anyway. We'll put these up in the show notes. Yeah. So if you're uh, starting kind of at from zero and not uh, just starting to get into the topic, that very first one at the top, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change by Mark Morano, just got a ton of great information in it. So I would start with that one. And then uh, lower down, uh, there's a couple of great websites. Uh, What's up with that and Climate Depot are good. And then... Uh, Follow me on Twitter if you want to see uh, me uh, try to debunk things uh, one at a time on Twitter. And actually, at the very bottom, I've got uh, notes for climate skeptics. I, I would direct you there, too, uh, to just uh, look at data on polar bears, hurricanes, and all sorts of things. It's just kind of one big post that takes on lots of topics that, in, in one shot there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, if anybody has more questions, please uh, do raise your hand. But I did want to moved on to a topic which I don't see you usually discuss, Tom, uh, which is uh, the kind of uh, uh, bigger picture politics that drive this um, hysteria around the weather and climate. Um, what are your thoughts about what is driving this? And I know initially we discussed this and we said, you know, it's it's not our job to have to explain why people believe ridiculous things in order to prove that they're ridiculous. Um, and I know you focus on just, you know, asking people why. And as you said, you know, focusing on the small 
details, which I think is extremely effective. But what do you see as the kind of bigger driver for why uh, people end up believing this, these kinds of absurd things? Yeah, so that's good. I don't know what's going on at the very top level, what's driving people. But I think within the, the climate debate here, I think most people that I'm dealing with sincerely believe that there is a climate crisis. And it's not like or climate scientists, I think a lot of them sort of believe in it, in that uh, it's not that they secretly know there's no crisis and they get up every day thinking, I'm going to start lying to people again today to try to make money. I, I think there's so much groupthink. I think that is the key of uh, the, the key in the, going on in most of their brains is that they think somebody else has already proven it. They're on this. They're on the right side, and then they can think of th themselves as uh, their heroes. They're fighting against the bad guys, and they're doing something that might help save humanity. I think that's a strong driver that they're doing stuff that makes them feel heroic. And if they were to find out that CO two isn't the climate control knob, then they would have to look back at uh, all the years of work they did on this and realize that. Uh, that they were in the wrong scientifically. That's just too painful. But uh, I see a lot more groupthink, and I, I don't really see conspiracy as much. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree with you, and I think there's the other the uh, the other aspect of it, which is you know my uh, my hobby horse um, is the monetary um, aspect that drives this. I think it's just. Um, the, the 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 reality is uh you know the science the way that uh, fiat money motivates science and i discussed this in detail in the fiat standard the way that uh the way that science funding happens in a free society ideally what would happen is you know anybody's free to write whatever they want and publish whatever they want and then if your ideas end up being productive in that they help people have a better way of uh, living they help people um, be more productive. Then you find a way of uh, monetizing that. Your ideas spread. You get more funding. Your university gets more funding. And so we'd have a free open marketplace of ideas, which is, you know, um, it's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's also a, a monetary marketplace where good ideas thrive and bad ideas die away. And so um, what happens when we have money that is... Um, controlled by the government is that it allows the government to take over the process of the marketplace of ideas. And instead of having my ideas out there in free competition with one another, we have ideas being, you know, winners and losers in, in the marketplace of ideas being determined top down by fiat, by government fiat, um, literally by fiat uh, and um, financially by fiat money. So the government can print all the money that it wants. And so they can finance people and they decide the agendas. And so I think this is a perfect recipe for groupthink. This is a perfect recipe for going down blind alleys and not having any kind of corrective to wake you up and tell you, hey, you're going down a blind alley, turn around, go back um, to a better uh, place. Because we don't have this open marketplace of ideas, what ends up happening is that you could continue to go down up this blind alley and um, you know the people who assign the funding are the same people who carry out the research. And so you just end up with more and more funding going toward the same kind of groupthink. And the only way to get funded is to submit to the tenets of the groupthink. And the only way to... Um, and, and so... That's just a, 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 a self-reinforcing cycle that keeps taking you deeper down the blind alleys. Now, um, I think, you know, we could get innocent um, wrong blind alleys there. But then what I argue in the fiat standard is that there's an agenda that is far more conducive um, to the financing, to the government that pays the bills. You know, whoever pays the piper calls the tunes. And you're far more likely to end up getting lost in blind alleys that serve a certain purpose. And so whether it is in nutrition science, and it's something that we discuss uh, frequently here, um, in nutrition science, we see that, you know, the modern scientific method is constantly telling people to stay away from meat and to replace it with cheap industrial waste, essentially. Um, instead of having animal fats, you should try the cheap industrial fats that are produced in horrific uh, forms, seed oils. And uh, these things are cheaper. 
And these things help to hide inflation. And so the dietary guidelines came out in the 1970s and they told people that they should be eating six to 11 portions of grains a day and that they should cut down on meat and that they should get some of their protein from, as much as possible from their protein, they should get it from plant sources and they should get fat from unsaturated fat because that's better, so you end up buying the industrial fat. I don't think that that is just an entire coincidence. I mean, it's obviously a broken pseudoscience, but it's not a coincidence because the price of meat was going up a lot. And so it's very, very um, politically inconvenient for anybody in power to witness the price of meat rising and people being reliant on meat. So if you tell people to substitute, take out the meat and eat beans and lentils, as we're seeing, you know, um, when you see the central bank has been tweeting this, the US Federal Reserve has been telling people, hey, replace your, tor- your, replace your turkey with tofu this year. And uh, it, it contains more nutrients and more proteins per dollar. And of course, that's nonsense because it's 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 infinitely in, it's inferior and it creates all kinds of problems. But the, why does the Federal Reserve <laughs> want to become Jamie Oliver? Why is it part of their mandate to tell people what to cook and how to eat? Well, the reason is they're trying to tell people to eat the cheap things because the more you buy cheap things, the less you, the price of your basket of goods goes up, the less you feel the inflation. And I think something similar is at work with the climate uh, hysteria. I think um, if you come up with conclusions that tell people uh, you should not be consuming oil, you're far more likely to get funded than somebody who says, you know, oil is actually very good for civilization. This is this is an absolutely incontrovertible statement. Um, we can't have all the nice things that we have if it wasn't for oil, for oil, gas, and coal. And yet, you don't have anybody in the mainstream of academia making this point. You don't have anybody at Harvard or any of the major universities in the U.S. making this point. You don't have any major energy. Um, scholars that are out there making the case for we need more fossil fuels you know the one person that i know of who's making that case is an independent person um uh, alex epstein you know he's out there actually bra- bravely putting his name out saying this is the moral case for fossil fuels he does not get uh, university funding you know, the university funding goes to people being hysterical about how fossil fuels are going to burn the oceans and boil uh, earth and whatever and I don't think that that's an entire that's entirely coincidental. It's very difficult to argue that this is coincidental. And this isn't to say that there's some giant conspiracy that's out there. It's just this is the political agenda that is likely to get you funded. If you go out and you tell people you need to spend, uh, you need to be buying more oil and more uh, more of these um, energy sources that are very price sensitive, you are going to have a hard time getting funded. Whereas if you find the reason why actually those energy sources are bad, you're going to have an easier time getting funded. What do you think of that? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I was going to bring up actually uh, the uh, like carbon credit markets in, in themselves that uh, billions and billions of dollars are on the line there. And of course, if CO2 isn't the climate control knob, then all, all of that money goes to, to zero. The carbon credits would be worth nothing. And also green energy in general, there's a lot of money to be made there. And people are going to be a lot less likely to uh, to want to force governments to buy uh, solar panels and wind turbines, et cetera, if uh, we find out they actually don't prevent bad weather. So anyway, enormous amounts of money is on the line, as well as uh, the other things we talked about. Yeah, I think I agree with you entirely on that. And this is why I think this is such an important point, because the the birth of the anti-fossil fuels science or pseudoscience, if you want, came in the 1970s. Initially, it was over population and over consumption. We were going to run out of all of those fuels and because the prices were rising. And so the way that they explained this was they put in all kinds of... Um, no, it's pseudoscience about earth is running out earth is running out and that's why the price is rising you know clearly it has nothing to do with going off gold and all of the money printing that's going taking place it's just you know we've hit the geological limits of earth we've tapped the earth dry of oil but here we are 50 years later and we are producing far more oil than ever and we just continue to produce more and more and more every year so clearly we're not running out we're not tapping the earth dry 
So what are so they the you know the conclusion has remained the same. And this is why you know this is just basically motivated reasoning. It's not real science. The conclusion has remained the same. We should stop consuming oil. Oil is bad. But the rationale is completely shifted. It's not that we have not enough oil, it's that we have so much, too much. We're burning the earth with it. So the same people that were um, concerned about running out of oil in the 1970s are now concerned about having too much oil. But the conclusion is the same. We need to move away from oil. And um, yeah, the same thing happened with um, food in the 1970s. We needed to move away because of you know heart disease and so on. It's been extremely catastrophic and has ruined so many millions and billions of lives really all over the world. Well, now inflation is back, and I think we're likely going to see more and more inflation over the coming years. And so we're witnessing those narratives really pick up. We're seeing um, you know every day um, regime media, you know, um, what I call, you know, the fiat media, the people, the media that basically is financed by people who benefit from the inflation is out there telling the peasants that <laughs> consume less oil, get on a bus, don't drive your own car, live in a smaller house, um, stay home, watch TV, um, get a VR set, don't go out, don't drive, and uh, eat lentils and don't eat beef, eat soy, uh, eat all of these uh, cheap industrial crops and don't eat meat. And I think this is, this is why I find this extremely important and fascinating and extremely relevant to monetary issues because it's, it, that's really what's driving the scientific method uh, in this regard. It's, there isn't a consensus that's born out of evidence that, oh, really, we've looked at it and it's pretty undeniable that an increase in CO2 is actually causing the earth to um, have incredibly bad things happen to it. It's different. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a set conclusion of we need to get people, we need to find ways to convince people to stay away from the things whose prices are rising. And then we need to find a rationale for it. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Thank you so much for joining us, Tom. This has been absolutely fascinating. I think this is going to be my go-to uh, reference to send to people about why I am one of the heretics. Um, I hope, you know, thank, I want to thank you again for all of the work you've done over the years, um, helping me and many, many people all over the world. And I hope um, more and more people start um, speaking out about this because it's... Uh, it's, it, it's, I think over the last five, 10 years or so, it's uh, gone way beyond just being a cute, uh, <laughs> a, a cute, you know, little side hobby. I think we're witnessing uh, the destruction of critical energy infrastructure that the world needs. And uh, more people that are, th that can see that this is ridiculous need to start speaking out about it, I think. Yeah, I think Jim Lakely said that uh, you may not care about the climate agenda, but the climate agenda cares about you. I think that's a good quote because it does. Yeah. Yeah. Another great one is um, you are the CO2 they want to reduce. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is really, yeah, you may, not, you may not care about it, but they care about you. They want to reduce you, basically. They, they want you to have fewer kids. They want you to um, live uh, basically in a tiny little house, um, not have any mobility and not consume a lot of energy. They basically want you to go back to living like a medieval serf. And the reason for that is, I think the ultimate reason is the inflation. The only way to can keep this inflation thing going is if you get people to consume less and if you get people to live shittier lives. And so we need to keep coming up with all these ridiculous narratives for why they need to do that. But we got to get you on Bitcoin, Tom. Uh, I forgot about yeah. that. We have to shill you on Bitcoin because Bitcoin fixes this. We always have to end almost every episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast with explaining why Bitcoin fixes all of this. I got your book on Audible, so I, I'm starting to listen to your book. One of them, yeah. Great. Yeah, and, and in a nutshell, Bitcoin can reinstate a free market in science because it's, if Bitcoin basically takes away the government's money printer because people are using a real money that is hard to make that nobody can print, then there's not going to be a lot of people willing to pay out of their own pocket for uh, financing pseudoscience. And then uh, we'd have a real free marketplace of ideas. And then the other side of it is the fact that Bitcoin is really 
um, liberating the energy market from the insanity of the last couple of decades where we've destroyed the energy sources that we need in favor of these primitive pre-industrial sources that are um, essentially superfluous and unreliable and cannot be used and extremely expensive in real terms. Bitcoin uh, mining is the freest market in the world for energy. It'll buy energy from anybody anywhere in the world um, because you don't need to build infrastructure to transport the energy that is produced um, into any particular location where it is used. So you can have remote generation of energy and um, it would be uh, monetized through just a simple internet connection via satellite. And so I think it's going to revive the energy industry all over the world and it's going to allow us um, around the world to have more and more cheap energy, which is the exact opposite of what we've been um, experiencing over the last few decades. So hopefully one day, um, maybe next time we'll have you on, we'll talk about Bitcoin more. That sounds great. I got to get up to speed on that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thanks to everybody else for attending and for all the questions. And I'll see you next time. Take care. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.